Okay, in this video, I'm going to talk about space time and how it works. This is probably one of the most important videos, so I hope that you stick with me through it. And that's just because in all of the talks that I give about how artificial gravity works or how faster than light travel works, I always need to explain what space time is. They're all rooted in understanding space time and Einstein's theory of gravity. If you remember from school, you learned about Newton's theory of gravity. Apple fell on his head and we treat gravity like a force, um, Newton's way of doing it. So uh, you have two objects, they're gravitationally attracted to each other. That gravitational attraction goes away the further apart that they get from one another. And that's how we can explain things falling on Earth, things orbiting around the Earth, um, kind of basic stuff. The day that apple fell on my head was the most momentous day in the history of science. Not the apple story again. That story is generally considered to be apocryphal. What? How dare you? So Newton's theory of gravity explained 98% of everything, but in the early 1900s, we were starting to study a lot more in our universe, and it wasn't really explaining everything that we were observing. A perfect example of this is Mercury's orbit around the sun um, because it actually processes. So by that, I mean it traces out a flower shape as it goes around the sun. And you couldn't really explain that using Newton's theory of gravity. There had to be something else that was tugging at the planet to make it make that motion. So people actually thought that there was a secret evil planet on the other side of the sun that we didn't see called Planet Vulcan. Like, I'm not even kidding. It was Planet Vulcan, which is objectively awesome as a Star Trek fan. But aside from that, Newton's theory of gravity couldn't explain Mercury's orbit. So Einstein did a lot of thought experiments and he comes around in the early 1900s and starts to conceptualize our universe as um, four dimensional. So you think of, uh, uh, we move forward, back, left, right, up, down. Those are our three dimensions, any combination of those. But then we also step forward continually in time. So time is another dimension that's always progressing forward. And he built this sort of mathematical four dimensional fabric and basically said that our universe just sits in this 4D fabric of space and time, space time, and gravity comes from that. So if I'm starting to lose you, here's a good analogy that you may have seen before, and that's the bowling ball on the trampoline. So we talk about putting a bowling ball on a trampoline, you can kind of picture what would happen, it would all dip down. If you flick a marble around it, the marble will orbit just like the moon orbits the earth or the earth orbits the sun, planets orbiting other objects, you know, it, it works, you can visualize it. Um, another good example of this is like, if we want to launch a rocket off of the earth, we need to climb out of our gravitational well. So all that fuel, all that energy that it's taking to launch, that's what it's doing to try to crawl out of our gravitational well to make it into sort of a flatter space time that's easier to travel around. Um, so Einstein came up with this theory and then he applied these equations to Mercury's orbit and voila, lo and behold, it actually worked. And he was so excited that he took two days off to each their own, that's fine, whatever. Um, but shortly after that, there was a solar eclipse. And one of the things the scientists were able to do is that they could look at the stars in the sky and kind of map out where the stars are. And then when the moon passed in front of the sun and it blocked the sun, the stars actually appeared to be in a different position from what they actually were in. And this is an effect that we call gravitational lensing. So that means that the light from these stars is getting curved around the sun and it reaches us. So for us, it looks like it's in a different direction. This was the first test about Einstein's general general relativity space-time theory that actually kind of made it look like it made sense. So it applied to Mercury, then they tested it during the eclipse, that stood up, and then um, scientists tried to figure out, okay, well, how else can we try to prove that it's this versus this force idea that Newton did? And that was something called gravitational waves. So Einstein came up with his theory for gravitational waves and what he did is he took his equations for flat space time and then he perturbed them a little bit so he just kind of poked at space time and what he found was that you could work through all the equations and you actually get a wave equation at the end that travels at the speed of light. 
So that means that anytime something happens in our universe that's not perfectly symmetric, either something explodes or crashes into something, um, any sort of weird thing that happens, that causes ripples in space-time. You can imagine uh, bouncing a bowling ball on the trampoline, that trampoline is going to ripple out. So Einstein said, yep, there's gravitational waves, but no one will ever detect them. They're way too small. Scientists said, challenge accepted. So scientists in the early 90s, all the way through 2000, 2010, started developing these laser interferometers to detect gravitational waves. And lo and behold, a couple years ago, they announced that they made a detection, that they saw the ripples in space-time from two colliding black holes, which is amazing. I'll go into that in another video, but I just wanted to point out that we were able to directly detect the motion of space-time, so we could detect that trampoline. The question that you're probably wondering is, why do I care? Uh, that all seems fairly small and insignificant. Yeah, whatever, Newton's theory works for 98% of stuff. Why do we care about space-time or discovering it or learning about it, whatever. Um, you should care, because if you're a sci-fi nerd like me, this is the only way that we're gonna get warp drive or artificial gravity. So all of these discussions that I do of how warp drive works or how we could create artificial gravity in some weird funky science way, um, if we want to figure out how to go faster than light, we're going to have to study space-time. We need to understand how to bend that fabric or that trampoline to make it work for us and do our evil bidding. Not evil bidding, we're gonna go find other planets. So <laughs> anyway, um, that's kind of an overview of how space-time works. I hope that cleared up some questions for you. Um, you can feel, if you were here, if you were sent here from another video, you can feel free to head on back that way. Or if you're just here poking around and, and learning, then keep on learning. All right, thanks for stopping by. Catch you next time. You see, Sir Isaac, the joke depends on an understanding of the relativistic curvature of space-time. If two non-inertial reference frames are in relative motion... Do not patronize me, sir. I invented physics.